Hi, I'm Mike Lennington, CEO of Wounded Warrior Project. I'm honored to be with you all virtually today at the Global Security Forum. And up front, thank you to the World Affairs Council for hosting this important gathering and being a leader in how we understand and advance the security of our country and the world. At Wounded Warrior Project, our mission is to honor and empower wounded warriors, the brave men and women who raise their hands to volunteer in service to our nation. Their service and sacrifice for the security of our country is one we remember and honor each and every day. The critical dialogue of this forum, understanding the global security landscape today and for years to come, can have direct impact on those currently serving and those considering uniform service in the future. As we consider the needs of our service members, veterans, and the greater military security community, we must continue these essential conversations. On behalf of my entire team, thank you all for taking the time to participate in this important forum. And should you ever need any support, Wounded Warrior Project is here for you. All right, I think it's down to me to, uh, to, to kick things off. I'm, I'm Luke Kinetic, a moderator for today's panel on Afghanistan uh, on behalf of Megan Torrey and all the folks that do such a wonderful job for the Global Security Forum and have for years. Uh, welcome, appreciate you. Uh, you tuning in. I, I hope you find it appropriate to us to show that video from the Wounded Warrior Project because uh, you know these these are tough times for uh, for lots of communities and and certainly the Wounded Warrior and the Warrior uh, community. We'll hear a little more at the end from uh, from Brian uh, Dempsey, but we didn't want to not acknowledge that this is a time where we need to rally around and and bring a lot of communities together in a in a in a tough time. I'll introduce our panelists um, 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 very shortly and let me set the panel up. Uh, a little bit, uh, uh, kind of what it is and, and, and what it didn't. Uh, maybe a lot of you have heard the saying, things are never as good as they seem or as bad as they seem. Um, you know, right now to me, things seem pretty bad when you look uh, at Afghanistan and you hear words like strategic failure and other things thrown around, I think quite, uh, quite correctly. But I do think that saying is still true. So what we're trying to do is look forward, certainly understand what's happening on the ground now. And we have one, hopefully two, voices right from uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, so to speak, that can help with that. And then folks that have spent a lot of time uh, uh, on, on, on the ground. But, but, you know, unlike what you might see on the cable TV late night or otherwise, this is, this is more kind of sober-minded, thinking about it uh, um, professionally with passion, because this all hits us personally and nobody's going to say uh, otherwise. But what's in play diplomatically, information, military security, and, and, and economically, because this is all uh, very real to anybody tuned in and anybody uh, on the screen, I would, uh, I would uh, submit. And, you know, for me, what's very real is introducing our uh, first uh, uh, panelist, because I can't do it by name, because she's an Afghan female who served with such distinction in the diplomatic corps, but is under threat, and her family is under threat, and we would, uh, you know, potentially put her in harm's way if we gave away too many details of who she is, but she's very bravely uh, agreed to, to, to join us uh, today. So you should see her on the screen as former senior diplomat, but I'm going to refer to her and call her by the pseudonym Ambassador Goodwill, because she's someone that's been right at the center of progress for, for more than a decade, probably a couple of decades, and, and, and it certainly can give us insights about how we should be seeing things now. And then um, the next next panelist we're going to have in play is Mark Jacobson, and I'm tempted. I'll go ahead and do it. I'll introduce him as my next door roommate uh, when we served together at the International Security Assistance Force back in 2006, which is ancient history, but also pretty pivotal in a lot of ways. But, you know, he was a Senate staffer then doing very interesting work uh, with uh, uh, the Navy and then came back uh, later as the deputy senior civilian representative for NATO. And, and NATO is a, is, a, is a huge piece of all this when you uh, uh, think about it and has been very involved with recent events and getting people uh, out and is now at the uh, Maxwell School at, at, at Syracuse as an assistant dean, uh, doing wonderful things in, in international relations and security and mentoring next generations and, and, and bringing, bringing them along. I, I'll mention him because hopefully he'll join us uh, in, in progress, but we're, we're also honored to, to have part of the proceedings, Mohammed Musa uh, Mamodi, goes by uh, Musa. He's a World Affairs Fellow, uh, works with Emma Skye, who a number of us in this community know and uh, respect at Yale. Uh, for more than a decade in Kabul, uh, led the, the human, Independent Human Rights uh, Commission uh, uh, there uh, as a lawyer by trade and, and, and did all the hard work of following uh, human rights there. Also did 
tough work uh, on, uh, on 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 building a democracy as well. And you know, as all these folks, experts on the region, expert on uh, experts on the larger world. So I, I probably already talked too much. And me, you know, I'm here to moderate and facilitate some crosstalk. I was spokesman way back in the day in Afghanistan. I've tried to follow along like many of you uh, looking in. And we have a Q and A. Uh, box open, get your questions in there. We've already had a few and we're definitely going to key off of that as well. But for openers, I would like to turn to Ambassador Goodwill. It's still guts me that we have to use a pseudonym uh, to kind of open us up for around three to five uh, minutes of remarks. And then we'll turn to Mark and then we'll have some discussion and then get to your questions. So Ambassador Goodwill, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be part of this important discussion at this uh, critical time. And thank you so much, uh, Luke, for the kind introduction. Um, as we all know, the situation in Afghanistan is dire and people suffer mentally, physically and economically. We all wanted a responsible end for this war. Unfortunately, in, it ended in, in a quite different way that caused even more tragedy and chaos. Um, in fact, um, one can say that the, that long and costly war made no changes for Afghanistan. Why? Because uh, the war started in Afghanistan to eliminate Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, their supporters. That was the main reason of the war, we know. Uh, but at the meantime, US and other donors helped Afghans to make changes in the country for a better life. We made huge achievements. Um, in education, health sector, in, in institutional building, capacity building, women, and human rights, um, to, name, to name a few. But unfortunately, we lost all of them in just one day. Uh, therefore, the only change after 20 years of US presence in Afghanistan, which is tangible right now, is the loss of American and Afghan men and women in uniform who fought for their countries and for the safety of the world and lost their lives. Um, there are so many issues to talk about Afghanistan, what's going on right now in Afghanistan, but I would like to briefly touch based on two issues, which is very important for, for me and I know for everyone. Uh, it's security um, and the women and human rights situation in Afghanistan. Um, the security is even worse uh, than it was before. Um, the Taliban are uh, alleging that their biggest achievement so far is that they are successful in providing security for Afghans. Yeah, they are not committing suicide attacks anymore uh, to kill the civilians. That's right, because they, they were the ones that doing this on has. But this is not the security. Uh, with Taliban gunmen controlling the streets of Kabul and other cities, searching for ev everyone and anyone who had supported that previous government or Americans, um, seizing people's legal properties, forcing people to move from specific provinces to another, killing and torturing journalists, hitting women. Uh, the red and fair have already set in across the capital and um, other parts of Afghanistan. So this is not security. Um, secondly, um, Taliban uh, does not believe in any kind of human rights values and principles. Um, and I want to emphasize that they are not changed and they will never change. We do not see the change. The only change that uh, I honestly can, can see right now, they are so good at using technology than they were before. They are so good. So this is the only change. They have not allowed women to go to school or work yet. Um, if you see the TV broadcast and media, it's totally changed. We do not even have access to information because the journalists cannot work freely. So it means they already banned people, especially women, from access to their fundamental rights. Um, Americans in other um, countries have helped uh, vulnerable Afghans to get out of the country, which is amazing. And um, I'm very happy for each one of them and I'm supporting that. However, there are thousands who do not want to live under the control of the Taliban and are not able to get out of there. So, uh, uh, I want to say and emphasize that the life of those who are still living in Afghanistan, especially women and children, really matter. And the world uh, should not allow them to suffer under the control of the extremist and uh, this barbaric group. Uh, so my mes message for the future of Afghanistan, which is 
I, I cannot say anything about the future because it's unforeseen for me. So the world should use their influence on the Taliban and make them uh, respect women and um, minority groups. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here and uh, would be happy to answer um, any questions. Thank you. We're going to turn to Mark and, you know, your voice is being heard here and you see folks uh, in the chat saying thanking you for your courage and, 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 and conviction. But the fact that your voice can be heard here and not heard elsewhere speaks volumes. And you've hit a number of things that I want to pick up on and follow on questions. But but Mark, over to you for. Right. Thank you, Luke. And, and I, I really want to echo a few things I, I've, I've heard here already. First, um, uh, my good friend Mike Lennington and his uh, praise. Um, and um, uh, honoring of our wounded warriors, uh, you know, from uh, perspective of someone who served uh, and someone who uh, has close friends uh, who've served as well, that, that's just, just so incredibly important. Uh, second to the ambassador, I, I applaud your bravery. Uh, I am heartbroken uh, that, that you can't speak in, in a more open setting, not here, but, but in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, as, as many Americans know, uh, who've been there, you know, we've, we've fallen in love uh, with the people and uh, with the country and with the nation. And it saddens me as much as I would, uh, if, as it would if I had lost my own nation. And, and I hope that this uh, is something that, that uh, the people of Afghanistan can overcome. And I think this is one of the greatest differences between now and the 1990s, is that you have generations of, of Afghans who've now lived under uh, freedom if during time of war, imperfect, but uh, again, uh, not the rule that uh, they once had. And I think there's some hope there uh, that the Taliban will not be able to repress uh, the yearnings for freedom. Uh, I realize that uh, they have no respect for human rights. I, I agree with the ambassador that uh, they are no different than the Taliban were before. Uh, I worry uh, for, for the men, women, and children of Afghanistan uh, in the, the weeks, months, and, and years to come. But uh, I, I'm hopeful that over the long term, Afghanistan can free itself again. Uh, I, I just wanted to say a couple of words um, about the general situation as I see it from a, a US foreign policy perspective. And uh, I've been uh, paying close attention to the hearings on Capitol Hill the last two days, which while not comprehensive, uh, are giving a glimpse at least into the military situation uh, as it existed during the, uh, the retrograde, the withdrawal of US forces, and then the, the problematic evacuation. But it's also been introspective a bit, uh, looking back on the last 20 years and what we think uh, may have gone wrong. Although let me caveat that with the saying that even back in 2006, we understood, the military understood very well what was working and what wasn't, uh, whether or not the militaries, uh, the US primarily, but also uh, the British and uh, our uh, Germans, Canadians, uh, Australians, and, and other partners. Uh, if we were honest uh, to ourselves, that's, that's a different question. And of course, the policy decisions made uh, during the Bush, Obama, Trump, uh, and uh, Biden eras uh, were, were never all perfect. In fact, in some cases, far from it. So uh, a couple of things uh, I would say. Uh, first, uh, looking at the current situation, uh, there is so much more the United States needs to do in terms of getting uh, P2 visa applicants and SIV applicants out. Uh, that's largely a State Depart a Department problem. And unfortunately, I don't believe they are giving this the seriousness uh, that they need to. I think Congress will need to press them on that. Uh, the American people need to press them on that. The international community needs to press them on that. Uh, right now, they're uh, devoting uh, too few resources to the issue. Uh, in terms of the whole of government, the full U.S. government approach, there still is no single person in charge. Uh, there are still bureaucratic problems at the State Department, such as the requirements for in-person uh, interviews with consular officers. Uh, look, that, that's not only ridiculous, but the United States has faced that problem in the past and has found ways to waive the bureaucratic requirements. It does not take an act of Congress to make these things happen. It just uh, requires the direction of uh, the deputy or the secretary, one of the deputies or the secretary of state. Uh, so the desire to make this happen, and I don't know why they're not. Uh, there are still private organizations and private individuals paying to get Afghans who need help out of the country. And again, that's notwithstanding that it's getting increasingly difficult, but at the same time, the State Department has plenty of funding and authorization from Congress to do it. So once again, I'm not sure why they aren't. And finally, there are some legislative things that will need to be done. Uh, the Congress, uh, the US Congress will need to pass 
uh, legislation allowing uh, the humanitarian parolees, which will be about 90% of the Afghans who come through the American system, uh, there needs to be a, a, a way to give humanitarian parolees uh, financial assistance. Right now, there's not. Uh, even the private sector, um, those of you familiar with Airbnb's efforts uh, to, to give free housing, that doesn't even apply to humanitarian parolees. So we're missing about 90% of the Afghans who are going to come through the system. Uh, in terms of, of more actions required on the ground, diplomatic action, working with the Qataris who are way ahead of everybody else in terms of uh, creating pathways for Afghans to get out of the country. Let's hope that increases. The United States has to put more pressure on uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and other border nations to allow more Afghans to come through, uh, if, and only temporarily, perhaps, to allow them to move on to, to final countries. Uh, this just isn't being done, uh, nor is guidance being provided by the State Department to the U.S. embassies in these countries to provide consular services to Afghans who are going across. So from a matter of U.S. policy, we're shooting ourselves in the foot right now if our desire is indeed to hold the faith with those Afghans who worked with us side by side, um, whether as SIVs or in our, whether or not they're SIV eligible, P2 eligible, or just require humanitarian parole uh, status uh, or refugee status to get out of the country. Um, I'll conclude with saying a few remarks on what the United States needs to think about looking forward. There's of course uh, the issues I've described. There are regional issues as well. Uh, for ex or uh, high level diplomatic issues as well. For example, will the United States have to recognize the Taliban in order to accomplish our objectives? Um, one question is if the Taliban would legitimately let everyone out who needs to get, who wants to get out and wants to leave, would that be worth the price of recognition? Or is that the wrong approach? Should the requirement be, we will recognize you if you show, if for some, some way or in some way you show a commitment, a serious commitment and a record of uh, working your way to a, a more uh, internet, a greater, um, um, sorry, I'm trying, I just lost the word there, uh, comporting with, with international standards of, of, of human rights. Again, doubtful, but you know the price should be very high for diplomatic recognition, but it is a big question the United States will have to face. Uh, we'll also have to consider, um, uh, you know, consider our relationships with regional partners. Um, we have no relationship with Iran now, except uh, a budding one on, on uh, nuclear uh, arms control issues. Um, Pakistan, we've had a dysfunctional relationship for well over 20 years. Uh, there's a dynamic between India and Pakistan that's going to affect the regional situation as well. And then, of course, uh, we'll have to consider the role the Chinese and Russians may try and play. But again, these are considerations. They're not immediate concerns for the United States. Um, I think we will have to recognize, though, that, that Afghanistan's neighbors are going to play a role because of their geographic proximity. It's hard to imagine Afghanistan, uh, whether under Taliban or other control, that doesn't have some sort of working relationship with the Iranians, uh, particularly economic ones in the West, same with Pakistan um, and, and with uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and, and the other stands to the north. Um, additionally, the United States is going to have to grapple on the issue of what went wrong. Now, in a perfect world, we could see objective studies and congressional hearings that help us identify what worked, what didn't work, and how might we do better the next time we face uh, such a, a conflict. Um, you know, should we take a, a law enforcement approach, um, or uh, should we have done a counterinsurgency approach from the beginning? Should it have been all diplomatic, or perhaps we weren't uh, violent enough? You know, whatever the answer is, uh, we have to consider things like the growth of the ANSF. Uh, did we do too much mere imaging and try and create the U.S. Army versus the type of force that the uh, Afghans truly needed? Where did we succeed and fail on governance? Where did we succeed and fail on, on the corruption issues and on the traditional stabilization and development issues? This, there's a great deal that needs to be looked at. But if the United States does not take a serious look, whether from the U.S. government or uh, private public partnerships in conjunction with universities and think tanks, then we are going to fail ourselves in the long run. Uh, on that somber note, I, I will conclude and uh, happy to answer uh, any of your questions or dive into any of the, the areas you'd like me to get into. I'll jump back in there. You can see Mark's been on TV uh, a lot lately. Uh, you, you can probably see him there. We give him a little bit more airtime than they give him there. And, and you can, you know, I'm glad we, I'm glad, I'm glad we are. Uh, you touched on a lot of it, you know, that accountability aspect and, and, and lessons learned, but also that fixing responsibility and a game plan for engagement. 
uh, going forward uh, and kind of centered around uh, uh, human rights as a primary consideration. So I think that might be an appropriate way to bring uh, Musa in. I appreciate you kind of joined us late and uh, missed a little bit of this. I did introduce you uh, um, earlier, but whatever you'd like to pick up on, I know I personally would, would love to hear kind of your thoughts connected to, to human rights and, and, and the regional neighborhood, uh, so to speak. But Musa, whatever you'd like to, to jump in with for three to five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Luke, and um, I'm so glad to uh, be in this forum. Um, uh, thank you, Mark. I'm glad to see you uh, and the ambassador. Um, uh, I echo the ambassador's words on our um, concerns over the future of Afghanistan, especially when it comes to human rights issues. And because I come from that background, I think uh, my focus should stay on, on, on human rights issues in Afghanistan. Uh, unfortunately, August uh, changed everything for us. Um, uh, the hard won human rights achievements that we have made in Afghanistan is lost over time. And uh, it's the scariest moment and time for all of us, for human rights activists, women rights activists who ever worked for uh, improvements and promotion protection of human rights in Afghanistan. And because of this, this um, sudden uh, loss and change of everything, many, uh, Afghans who risk their lives and uh, champion promotion protection of human rights, unfortunately, are trapped in Afghanistan uh, and fearing for their lives and uh, security and safety, uh, both their lives and their families and members and, and friends. Uh, Taliban, unfortunately, um, uh, has not changed uh, uh, despite the fantasy of some of the media reports or you know some pictures that are broadcast uh, here and there um, they are not changing because their policy and their um, you know does not allow them to change and 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 and, and you have seen that's the graphic uh, uh, pictures from herat that's the hanged uh, corpse of people um, on the um, uh, power plants uh, flanks and and um, um, uh, in, in, in Herat cities or uh, extrajudicial killing that they uh, have uh, um, carried against uh, individuals in uh, reportedly in, in provinces like Panjshir and uh, uh, in Ghor in other places. Um, they have shown also that they are inconcilable uh, towards women rights uh, they haven't sh shown the regards and respects the women rights towards women rights and um, women freedom in Afghanistan. They banned them from going back to school, um, to universities, and that's uh, very much concerning for all of us. Uh, they have been um, uh, uh, very brutal and tyrannic uh, system when it came to um, minority groups, especially uh, persecuted Hazara minority groups in Afghanistan. They are fearing for their life, their properties. And now you, we have been hearing reportedly that uh, a, a big number of people were uh, uh, ordered to uh, leave their lands and um, you know villages and, and, and move from, from uh, very remote areas in, in Daikundi province. So this kind of in, um, actions and uh, policies so far in place, indicates that the future of Afghanistan when it comes to pro protection of human rights, respect for human rights, and fulfillment of human rights would be uh, very, very dark and uh, uh, worrisome for every one of us. And it brings us to the uh, some of the recommendations that uh, we might have for the international community that uh, their shared responsibility for promotion and protection of human rights would not end only with you know, withdrawing or uh, bringing some people out of Afghanistan. I think they have a still a responsibility towards 35 millions of people who suddenly found themselves living under a, a system that they don't want to. And uh, anything short of uh, a fully functioning democratic system that guarantees human rights of all Afghans, I think, uh, would not uh, legitimize any government in Afghanistan, be it Taliban or other form of uh, system there or, or people uh, to be recognized by the international community. In the meantime, I think uh, uh, human rights defenders, women rights activists, they should be supported and uh, support as Mark mentioned it uh, should be continued for them 
either to live in Afghanistan in dignity or uh, have a pathway to leave Afghanistan in a safer place and safer um, areas. And I think that, that would be something that the international community and the US could do that. And I um, applause the, the uh, remarks from Mark that made uh, uh, earlier on issuing more visas and allocating more uh, places for Afghans to, to be to become paroli or become uh, to be supported by the individuals, organizations, or uh, government scheme in the United States. I think that's uh, including uh, schemes for human rights defenders, scholars at risk, artists, musicians, and all those people who cannot find a safe and um, um, uh, normal uh, uh, environment for their activities and for their living in Afghanistan. And I think that's a situation that uh, you know, we we would like to see in Afghanistan that um, uh, the international community must exert their uh, utmost power on regional power in on on Taliban and everyone uh, to 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 bring the situation as such that Afghans can live in, in dignity and with their freedoms and rights. Uh, and I also I should make this uh, point that many of our regional uh, uh, country, uh, country and neighbors, uh, including the international community, have um, repeatedly uh, pledged that they would not recognize any government coming out of, you know, violence or uh, taking power by 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 force or by violence. And this uh, uh, pledge must be honored, and it should be continued. And a recognition for a government, unless otherwise it recognized, back to uh, restoration of constitution and. Uh, a system of government that is based on democratically elected uh, uh, government uh, should not be recognized. And also full recognition for respect, uh, protection and fulfillment of human rights is an uh, essential part that we should uh, see it in Afghanistan and from our partners and for our, from our allies towards Afghanistan people. Thank you very much. Very good, gosh, you've uh, hit a, a lot of things there. Um, Here's what I'd like to do, because I want to bring you all back in on this. And, and to me, it, it seems like, you know, the human rights and the state of play and, 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 and engaging the Taliban uh, is, is, is kind of front and center. And I have a lot of questions along those lines, you know, how technology does it. You know, I, I get, uh, you hear people say, hey, Taliban is not homogenous. I kind of accept that. Most people aren't homogenous. And it, but it's not 96, right? And, and technology in the world and a lot of things have changed. And, and, and I think we've had someone give us a question that could potentially cut across all that. And it's from, from Mark Mayberry, uh, who, who's very active uh, with the Global Security Forum and, and the, 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 the World Affairs Council here. Let's, let's feed in his question. Um, I can take a volunteer to take it first, but probably Ambassador Goodwell is the right person to kick this off. What is, and y'all can all see it in the QA as well, but I'll read it. What is the best way to bring international pressure to bear to protect girls and women and more generally ensure the human rights of the people of Afghanistan. So international pressure. I know we've already talked about some sort of relentless ways we can do it through our diplomacy and getting people out and the like, but kind of pick up on that. Ambassador Goodwill, what, what is the right way for the international to, to the community to apply pressure at this point? Um, uh, thank you. Um, this is a very important question and has uh, also Mark mentioned very well um, from the US. Um, specifically and from the world, the diplomatic pressure is very important, especially at this moment that the Taliban needs uh, to be recognized worldwide. Um, I, in my view, this is the very, um, uh, I can say the, the most important thing that put a lot of pressure on them to first, they, they do their homework and then uh, the world, um, if one day the world decides to recognize the Taliban, then they do it not right now because the, we we raise our voice and the people of afghanistan raise their voice for the peace deal what they are doing or doing for the last more than one year with the taliban that was not the correct way but nobody heard or i don't know what happened um, i'm not sure and it's not the time to talk about that but right now the, we are saying, and everyone around the world, so if one day you want to recognize the government of the Taliban, first make sure that at least they bring uh, any kind of change um, in their mentality towards women and uh, minority groups. Um, uh, because right now the Taliban need the world 
um, to, for, for the support. They don't have anything. They don't know how to govern. They don't have money. They need the support. So why not we should step in and tell them, look, you, you, you need to do your homework first and then we will do this. If we, we, we just um, believe or trust the Taliban, what they are saying in the media, this is not correct because they said the same things no, we are not against the women's education or the women's right, or we do it according to Islamic rules. This is a very broad uh, and general uh, statement from the Taliban. We don't know what, what does Islamic mean to them. They have their own interpretation. We have so many Islamic countries. The women freely can go. They can freely choose what to wear, but not in Afghanistan. They, they, they say everything to the women and you have to do it, even the men, not only the women. So th this is my, uh, my view that um, uh, a lot of pressure, is especially diplomatic, from not only the US, from the world, from the UN, should be put on the Taliban. Thank you. Mark Musa, who wants to jump in next? I think, uh, um, as I said earlier, um, the international, uh, a community play an important role in saving Afghanistan from uh, an, another new cycle of war and conflict. Because as we know, uh, Taliban would not be able to control Afghanistan forever. And there are um, already um, uh, signs of you know, unrest and the resistance against their rule in Afghanistan. And very soon, because this um, takeover was so sudden, so shocking that people went to kind of a situation of numbness. And, and uh, as soon as people become, uh, you, know, you know, back to their senses and collect their senses, I think that it would be very difficult for Taliban to, to control Afghanistan. And my worry is that uh, the new cycle of violence would be much bloodier because of the presence of uh, you know, other um, terrorist groups in Afghanistan, including the ISKP and others, uh, they have their organizations, they could uh, uh, be uh, uh, another, um, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, 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 bloody uh, players in, in, in Afghanistan war. Um, and since the, the resistance that started in, in Panjshir that was not supported properly, I think many people were disappointed, may find to, to go to, to you know, those uh, other groups that are there. And I think that should be taken seriously from a national security point of view or global security point of view uh, uh, and, and should not allow that situation go to that one. And the, the, the way that the international community could partner with Afghans is that, uh, yes, Taliban needs the recognition, but Taliban cannot control Afghanistan, uh, especially when they uh, do not want to recognize um, other uh, groups in Afghanistan. They, should, they do not want to broaden the basis of the government in Afghanistan. They do not want to recognize women rights and minority rights in Afghanistan, and they do not want to respect human rights. The situation might go uh, from, from now, which is worse to uh, to a, a very bad kind of situation. So the, as I mentioned, that the international community should demand uh, the way that you, they were working together with the regional powers, uh, the, the, the United States could work with China, with Russia, with other regional players, with Pakistan, to go to a kind of arrangements that will bring back a constitutional kind of setups in Afghanistan that allow for democratic system to function in Afghanistan. Otherwise, we will have an endless cycle of violence, uh, conflict, uh, and um, uh, God knows that uh, Afghanistan were in, in, in trouble in the past 40, 40, 44 years, it goes another 40 years. We don't know that. So the good things also for Taliban is that today we recognize the change of the world, the change of the Afghanistan and allow the other uh, you know, people to participate through democratically elected uh, government and allow them to, to be empowered to vote. And it's not, you know, uh, we should not minimize it just as, okay, if you they you know, symbolically allow, you know, a few women to go to work or a few minority groups to be in, you know, some a sort of cabinet position, that's all. I think it's, it should be a meaningful, effective system in place. So guarantees that A, for Afghans, that's their dignities and rights are protected. B, for the regional security, that's 
Afghanistan are, you know, functioning government well in check and balance and for global security, because we have an interest in that, that's, uh, you know, no violent groups could just win and form a government. I think that would send a bad signals to the rest of the world. Moose, I want to bring in Mark, but you're saying that Afghanistan as an emirate could or should or might have the possibility of elections. I know there are a few emirates out there that are moving towards elections, but you think you could see a, a scenario where there'd be elections in Afghanistan? Well, I, I don't see that there is an emirate. Now, so far, there is a Taliban taking over uh, violently um, uh, by force, the government. Uh, but I, I think the only solution for Afghanistan, if we want to avoid another cycle of violence and um, um, blood in, in, in that country, it's the only way that we can agree that through a consensus, bringing together all players, as we, we agree on a system that is, you know, minimally democratic and, uh, and respects for human rights and uh, both women, minorities and everyone, individuals there in, in Afghanistan. Mark? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get a little dangerously out of my lane here, especially compared uh, with, with experts like Musa and the ambassador who know this personally and, and, and much better than I do. I, while, while I'm pessimistic, um, I think we'll see, we'll know a great deal more in six to nine months. Uh, it's clear that the Taliban have their hands full just trying to govern from uh, a technocratic standpoint. Uh, you know, running the, the electricity and the sewers. Uh, I had heard uh, some, some stories uh, passed along to me that uh, the Taliban have been uh, speaking with uh, uh, Afghans who work in the infrastructure field and ordering them back to work uh, and saying essentially, um, you know, we need, we need you to um, come back to work and uh, because no one knows how to do this and, you, and, and we'll guarantee your safety. Uh, and in some cases saying, look, train your replacement and we'll let you go. But, um, you know, from a, in terms of the, the broader ability of the Taliban to govern, uh, I, I agree with Musa. I, I, I'm not sure they do. The question is, will, is, is it a best case where Afghanistan looks like Iran with uh, a lack of respect for women's rights, but the ability of women to at least operate uh, certainly uh, more so than, than in 1990s uh, Afghanistan, I, I, but I, I'm just not I'm just not optimistic. I I, I don't see how election. I, I think elections will be interesting, but I think that they're going to severely limit who can run. Um, you know what we saw in terms of the from the Doha agreement on forward was the Taliban making deals. Uh, with regional and, uh, and tribal elders in order to solidify their ability to focus the military campaign on, on the um, central government. And maybe they're going to try the same approach, you know, sort of uh, through deals, uh, divide, uh, divide Afghanistan as much as possible so there's no unified opposition. I also worry about what role uh, the Haqqani network will play in terms of the politics of this. That's really kind of a, a new dynamic um, you know, very different from when we saw Hekmatyar join in with the government several years back. Uh, and I worry that the Haqqani network will play a bit of a spoiler. The question is how much power and influence will they have and will they effectively be able to block any sort of attempt at, uh, at normalcy? All right, I'm gonna try to keep us moving forward here. I see a great question from Jane. Jane, we're gonna get to that question, Mafita, in a little bit uh, here, and then I, ha I haven't done a good job plugging questions. Get your questions in there. We'll have a speed round at the end if, uh, if we need to to, uh, to, to to get through them. But, you know, I'll just give you a hint of my responses. When I went to Afghanistan, I, you know, I was amazed. It's such a, a vibrant, uh, uh, amazing country. Sure, you know, at the time I went, it was considered the second poorest. But that doesn't tell the story about what happens in terms of uh, economic potential and trade and activity and the like. So I kind of want to feed that in there. Let's, we look at the neighborhood, security, Counts going forward. People care what's going to happen with Al Qaeda or, or not in the region, right? But also, people care about economics and trade. Um, that strikes me as something where we may have leverage or it needs to be part of the game plan. Who wants to pick up on that? I think the, the, the Russian interests and the Chinese interests are very different. I think Russian interests 
Um, you know, you have two dynamics. You have the, 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 the Putin desire to once again be a great power. And then the, the question is, to what degree does that mean uh, some sort of uh, uh, Central Asian, South Asian presence? Uh, frankly, uh, I think the South Asia concern for Putin is India. Uh, that's where the interests lie. Uh, I think he's not even as interested in, in the stands uh, as much as he was. I think that the primary interest was being a thorn in the side of the United States. Commercial interests and counter narcotics concerns and things like that, I think, are all secondary. I, I don't think that those are enough to sway any major dynamics. The second piece, uh, China. I think there are legitimate economic interests. I, I you know, suggested to someone that if I were advising the Chinese, I would tell them, guess what? Um, you can't go and tell the Taliban that you are going to recognize their government in exchange for being able to launch a massive humanitarian assistance operation to get all of the SIV and P2 and potential P1 and all sorts of refugees out. You're going to pay for it. Um, and uh, then you're going to launch your own aid program. Now, we all know that the, for the Chinese, there's a quid pro quo. But I'm just saying on the international stage, there's been an opening because the United States has left. Um, what I do think is the Chinese are going to try to expand their economic uh, cooperation with the Taliban. But the problem is that they're, they have stronger economic interests with Pakistan. And I think those are going to have to balance off against each other. So I think the Chinese will take, again, as they usually do a long-term approach, uh, I do think we'll see things such as air travel. Uh, I think we'll, we'll see some um, commercial deals done. But I think the Chinese are going to be very cautious, especially um, after watching what happened uh, with the Anyak copper mine, although there was a lot, there were security issues there. I also wonder, will the Taliban be a little bit more skeptical of Chinese involvement uh, than uh, others have been? As we know, for example, in Africa, uh, the, the Chinese have essentially uh, uh, raped the countryside, uh, have only uh, allowed Chinese nationals to be hired to do the work. So again, no, no economic benefit to the host nation there. Uh, and I'm sure the Taliban have watched this and have no interest in uh, simply being uh, owned by the Chinese in that way. Okay, I want to give Musa and Ambassador Goodwill a chance to uh, jump in here. Maybe this is just piling on to the question already. Maybe you didn't. You know, do we... I almost feel like I got to be careful about not giving the Taliban too much credit. You know, uh, we probably wish for them to fail. I don't wish for people to be miserable, but you know, what does it look like if they fail? And then just kind of picking up one little small thing of the economics, you know, who runs the banks? How is banking going to look in Afghanistan? Probably a crazy question to even ask right now. It was the kind of question I asked when I was there that nobody could really answer who looked after the banks and how banking would work. So I just kind of, you know, flag that because, you know, countries that run well, uh, have, have have banking, right? So uh, maybe Ambassador Goodwill, whatever you want to pick up on that. I know I've kind of thrown a lot on the table. Um, yeah, uh, look, you raised a very important question. Um, the banking system uh, in Afghanistan was not that good in the past as well. So I just read um, a report um, um, today from the Reuters regarding the Central Bank of Afghanistan that um, even it, it, the condition of the bank, um, and uh, it, it was not good in the past months of the previous government. Uh, and uh, it was because of the mismanagement of that government. And you know, all the corruption and those things that destroyed everything in the country that um, it related to the previous government is another uh, question. But right now, uh, the uh, the condition economically in terms of the banks and people's money is really bad and people do not have access to their money. Um, so we, we watch the um, uh, big lines. People are going to the bank every day since it's opened uh, a few weeks ago, but they, they are only allowed to uh, withdraw a, a very small amount of money. Um, I, I'm not sure if the, uh, the Taliban uh, have, have been able to provide people with their monthly salaries. So people don't have anything. A lot of people, they, they spend all the, ca the cash they had at home. Uh, and I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of our relatives in Afghanistan, they are in a very bad situation. So I, I, I'm not sure, um, as uh, Musa mentioned, uh, the Taliban don't know this, uh, the, uh, how to 
uh, govern that they, do, they don't know anything the, uh, regarding the modern governing of the systems and do the stuff um, and they think according to what we see in their new cabinet they think that they can do everything only with with the mullahs they they brought up as, as the ministers and they can do everything which is not true and also as you mentioned or um, I, uh, I i don't remember you mentioned or mark that they are asking other um, special uh, um, uh, people who has a specialty in some of the some of the areas uh, to come and work. Um, that that may be right because they need those those people. But just ima imagine that they just uh, um, introduced a new um, chancellor for the uh, University of Kabul, um, and. Um, we we still have uh, the professors who who has for example phd they they want to work for the country but how you can imagine because of the, these uh, um, like unique creatures of god that they just speak and don't listen to people they have no logic people, people cannot work with them they they say that for example if we we don't have a saying if they want has to work they want has what, what they are saying so that, that's, that, that doesn't make sense if we if, uh, those people that are, are still in Afghanistan and they have a specialty and they stay there and work for the country. I am sure they all want to get out of the country. So um, in, in terms of the banks, I don't have much that much, a lot of information, but as far as I know that there is no money and people are suffering and they want to, to have access to their own money, but they don't. I mean, and Moose, I want to give you a chance to jump in, but you know, when I pick up there, there's a level of professionalism that uh, you just have to really, really worry about, and just in running things, you know, kind of, kind of what Mark talked about, tech, technocratic ability to to even do things. But I want to tie that to a question that that, that that that's everybody can read. But where does will and will the people enter uh, into this? Now, I get if you're suppressed and you can't, uh, you know, uh, ha have much of a voice or whatever, it can be it can be tough to. To, to exercise or, or demonstrate your your will, but I think it is a fair question. Um, where do the will of the people that either don't have a choice or have chosen to stay in Afghanistan? How should we be looking at that? Well, unfortunately, um, this time, uh, like previous time, many people would be trapped or uh, have to live under um, Taliban or a, a similar situation there because either they don't have the means to go out or um, they are. Um, they, they have to stay behind. The situation would be very difficult. And uh, as it was mentioned, um, is right now the situation is dire for Afghans. Uh, there is no job, there is no income, there is no salary, there is no access to their cash in banks. Um, so everything is uh, in a very, very uh, desperate situation. People are bringing and selling their uh, goods and stuff out of their homes and you know, just putting on sales so they can survive on, on, on daily basis. And I think that's that tells the situation that we are back into 1996 to 2000 when the people were just lining behind the bakery for hours and hours to just get a five breads uh, donated or uh, with subsidies from World Food Programs. I think that kind of situation uh, would be uh, inevitable if Taliban is going to insist on governing Afghanistan alone without any allowing other professionals, uh, uh, technocrats, and those people who could run the government and have a legitimacy both in the eyes of Afghans and also in the eyes of the international community. And that's the situation that um, I, I might be a very optimistic person uh, talking about elections and about democracy and all those issues. I think because I have worked in the past to, to to realize that that uh, ideals in Afghanistan, I have to continue like this, but that's the only way that we can see forward. Otherwise we have tried every kind of other sort of uh, form of government. You know, that's uh, communist regime, um, Mujahideen kind of states, Taliban kind of uh, Emirates, uh, all of this. But the only time that we had some functioning governments, I think that was the period of, very short period to, from 2001, 2020. Of course, there were corruptions, there were in inability and um, lack of capacity and weak leaderships and all those political issues, but at least people uh, could go and, and, and bring their petitions and uh, there were some level of 
uh, economic uh, progress. Uh, though I, I, I have to admit that at the end, during the pandemic, there, according to some uh, uh, data, 92% of Afghans live, uh, lived under poverty line. And, uh, and imagine that what would happen you know, right now in, in the absence of a uh, viable economic activity and support. And I don't think that China could uh, replace the United States uh, in just bringing 30 million or 40 million dollars in um, um, uh, humanitarian aids or Russia could replace or any countries in the in the world. And I think that's the, the amount of uh, donations and fundings that we were receiving through our national budget or directly to towards uh, through uh, NGOs, I, it was incredible. Uh, and, and, and no countries could substitute that. And I think that's a, a real danger. And I, I think that could be also used as a, a leverage uh, to bring Taliban to the table, to talk to the other people and, and uh, agree on a system that is functioning both for Afghans and, um, and also uh, provide a, a sense of security for region and for, for our um, world. Uh, so the people, Unfortunately, if there are no um, international pressure on uh, the Afghanistan current rulers, uh, they uh, would would suffer. And uh, in 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 that kind of despair moment, I think uh, they wouldn't have any any power over uh, deciding what to do or, or or demanding the government. I um, you know there's a question uh, from John Mill. You know what 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 Mele probably not getting his name right there. But you know what could be a successful strategy if what we've seen has failed to date. Kind of paraphrasing the question, I think you've given us some tracings of of, of, the, of the makings of a, of a strategy worth thinking about. I probably should have said up front. Some of you can probably see there's a Power Africa banner behind me. I'm at U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development nowadays. I'm not here in any official capacity with them in that. But aid, you know, from my perspective, aid needs to be every bit as part of the conversations of like how we're going to be able to keep up with. Uh, and what we need to track for counterterrorism, whatever else, and and that goes to to strategy as well, I guess you could argue. But I, I where does media, you know, I think of press. It looks like I haven't watched BBC as much as I should lately. CNN is in there. International media still has access, and there still seems to be interest. Um, gosh, I would think domestic media has got to be extraordinarily challenged now. But but press and then the combination of technology and social media, which worries me. When we have Ambassador Goodwill, who can't really use. Uh, her social media accounts going forward, but can still pick up the phone and is and talking. But that worries me because we don't have that social media pressure aspect. Um, who, who can who who wants to weigh in on that? I'll just make a brief comment. I and that is, I think this is one of the places the international community needs to uh, focus its effort, and that is the demands for you know as free a press as possible. Um, you know, and and we know that that because of technology today, it is possible to have uh, a somewhat independent media, uh, even uh, in, in an autocratic regime, but there'll be a constant struggle. I mean, whether we look at, you know, Turkey as an example, Hungary, you know, uh, you know for, for European examples, but uh, again, it's possible. I think it's going to be a constant fight though, uh, but that's something where the international community needs not just to put its moral support but provide the technological means to do these things and uh, provide the support, whether it's through organizations like, uh, uh, whether it's through private sector organizations or um, uh, IGOs such as a National Endowment for Democracy and things like that. We knew we had an awful lot to cover and we wouldn't be able to cover it all, but I think it's pretty far from what you see on, on cable TV. What I would like to do if, if, if the you know, fellow panelists are amenable is give uh, Musa and Ambassador Goodwill a chance for a quick last word. Then Mark and I will just do in a minute or less just a little snapshot of what our experience in Afghanistan was like. And then I want to turn it over to Mr. Brian Dempsey to talk just a little bit about uh, Wounded Warrior and, and kind of the healing aspects that they're uh, involved with. So uh, uh, Musa, maybe you can lead us off and then Ambassador Goodwill and then Mark and I'll be very brief. I think uh, this is a very critical moment, both for Afghanistan um, and for the international community, and also a chance to uh, build a new Afghanistan um, uh, with consensus that there is a need for respect, uh, protection, and fulfillment of human rights in Afghanistan, uh, a need for freedom of press to continue, uh, a rule of law based, not a you know, chaos under different interpretation from Sharia, uh, to be in place, a justice system that's functioning, and a government system that's functioning and 
coming out of the well and free well of Afghans uh, in one way or another. So this is a moment that should be seized through consensus at the regional and global level, as, as well as working with all parties in Afghanistan. I think that's a uh, uh, conclusion that it's Afghanistan is lost and just one party's um, you know, take over. Uh, that's the reality right now, but it's not, you know, the end of story. I think there are a lot of dynamics in Afghanistan that's, that has not shown or uh, displayed so far. So I think they, they should be uh, uh, seizing this opportunity to not allow that the current group solidify the power so they go back uh, the same way that they did uh, rule Afghanistan uh, 20 years ago. And also make sure that Afghans have dignity and uh, human rights and uh, we uh, the, the world is uh, more secure and, and safe. And that's, I think, uh, something that's bring together the, the world and uh, the interest of the international community and uh, interest of Afghan people. And I hope that also the, the US and the Euro European Union, uh, two very important partners should pay attention to immediate needs of uh, many Afghans who are in Afghanistan and fearing for their safety and security. And I, I think, uh, 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 Ambassador Goodwill did a very good job, you know, not revealing his uh, identity or uh, face, but it's this kind of fear is for everyone, including me, that uh, my family and friends are living in Afghanistan. I think that reprisal is there, but we have to be brave enough to come out and talk about these issues and the need and the aspiration and the ideas, ideals that we, we pursued in the past 20 years and we continue to pursue there no matter where. So. And that's what I, I, I would like to come, um, uh, come up as, as a conclusion here. And I hope that Afghanistan situation changes uh, uh, with the help of the uh, international community. And that's the only hope. And of course, Afghans are very willing and eager to contribute to that kind of efforts in building a, a, a better future. Thank you. Thank you for joining the panel. It's important that we hear your voice. We might run just a couple of minutes over here. Please hang in with us if you can. If you can't, you know, stay connected through Megan and, and the World Affairs Council, and, and you'll, you'll stay on top of these issues. Um, Ambassador Goodwill. Um, yeah, um, I, um, I also want to um, uh, emphasize on some, uh, some issues briefly. The first one uh, regarding the will of the people inside Afghanistan. Um, if we, we all remember uh, the survey, um, it was, I think, one or two years ago, there were only 5% of the whole Afghanistan supporting the Taliban. So just imagine 95% were against the Taliban. And we saw this the very uh, first days of the Taliban taking over Kabul. Uh, so the airport of Kabul was, was the witness of this, what I'm saying right now. People are people don't want them they, but but right now how they can demonstrate their will uh, be, because they they are scared of the taliban you know how they are barbaric and how they are violent they kill people they torture the people at the uh, first days the women uh, get out of their houses and they do did some of the demonstrations but they uh, uh, the taliban put them in the jails tortured them um, the journalists even were tortured. So that's something very difficult for the people. But I can say that most of the people are against this group and they don't want them. And secondly, regarding the women, once again, I want to emphasize, and this, this is very important for me as a woman and for the half of the population of Afghanistan, 50%, that they are they have been suffering all the time, almost in the 40, past 40 years, but the last 20 years were, were, were like the best years for us, that we were allowed to openly participate in the government, um, and have access to our rights and so on. Yesterday, there were news about the women that, um, those women that were kept in shelters, um, that the Taliban sent them to jails. So just imagine the Taliban at the first day they, they entered each province, they, they emptied the jails and freed all the men. But now they are putting the women in the jail, those women that are were kept in the shelters because they escaped, they are innocent. They escaped their families because of the violence or the fear. But now the Taliban put them in the jail instead of those criminals and terrorists that were freed from the, the jail. So this is very dangerous. These are only a few examples that we hear from the news. Um, 
And lastly, um, I want to say that Afghanistan and the people of Afghanistan need support. This support should go to the people, not to the Taliban. Um, and um, the, 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 world had, uh, the world had promised to us that whatever happens, uh, we will be there with you and we don't allow that you lose your achievements, especially women achievements, women and the human rights achievements. So I think this is the, the, this is the time that the world should step in, especially the US, and um, to uh, take action and do not allow the situation gets worse than, than what, it, what it is right now. Thank you. Gosh, your voice needs to be heard and we need to help you continue to deliver it. Um, you know, the, the, the ill will of the Taliban uh, make Afghanistan look like a dark, sometimes hopeless place. So Mark, what I'm asking you to do is do a hard turn and from, give us a visceral from your time in uniform of what it was like to be in Afghanistan. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to make that, the, it's hard to make that turn, but uh, uh, let me try and relate it to, uh, you know, to, to how I feel about it and why I stay involved today. Um, I, I was assigned there as, as an intelligence officer, uh, but, but my job was to, well, to do a couple of things. Um, uh, one, just to, to be out, to, uh, out understanding uh, what the political situation was like, what the economic situation was like at a strategic level. What did the Afghan government, what did Afghan government officials, um, humanitarian leaders, uh, civil society leaders, think about the situation as it was going on. That was everything from um, how, uh, whether or not the Taliban uh, were, were winning or losing, what was going right and wrong in terms of the economic situation, uh, what did they think about US military operations in particular, were we doing enough on civilian casualties. Uh, I had another job too, um, which was to be part of US special operations forces and, and go after high value targets. Um, and, and I had another job too, uh, which was, let's just say, in the intelligence arena that I still can't talk about, but it wasn't terribly exciting. Um, but it did let me drive around uh, Kabul a great deal, uh, which was nice. Uh, what was my experience like? Well, um, I wore a uniform that looked just like this most of the time. Uh, had a little bit of a beard, but not the kind of crazy long beard. Uh, as I said, it looked like you know more of the uh, I haven't shaved for four or five days uh, type look. Um, as Luke knows, we got to uh, eat out at a lot of great places. I, I miss, uh, I, I really miss the restaurants in Kabul. I miss going to my friends' homes uh, on Thursday nights and um, um, listening, uh, eating all night and listening to Pashtun music uh, till two or three in the morning uh, and then going out to Flower Street Cafe on a Friday um, and then out to Lake Karga maybe in the afternoon. And, and I miss my travels uh, to places as far uh, west as, as Nimruz. Uh, and uh, uh, as far north and east as Badakhshan uh, and, and all around the country. But I, I had a very different experience than most, most US military personnel. Uh, my scary moments were limited to the number of occasions I can count on one hand. Um, and they were generally of, of my own making purposeful uh, operations um, uh, to go after um, uh, IED cells and high value targets. But otherwise, uh, um, as, I tell, as I tell my students when they ask, uh, what was your job during the war? Uh, did you see much combat? I said, well, my job technically was if we saw combat to run away as quickly as possible and uh, call in an airstrike or to sneak around and avoid it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I saw enough that, uh, you know, from a perspective of, of being in the U.S. military, I never wanted to do that piece again, ever, uh, under any circumstances. Uh, um, it, was, it was frightening. Um, it was life-changing. Um, and it was the part of Afghanistan I try not to think about uh, at any point. I try and think about the good parts. Uh, Luke may remember we also got involved uh, in supporting a number of budding uh, girls' schools. Um, in fact, um, uh, some of them, again, can, they, not only do they continue to this day, they're flourishing. Um, and my only hope is, and my concern at the same time, is that these girls will be able to be educated even in a time of, of the Taliban. But what I will say is the brave women who set up these schools actually did so in more conservative areas um, and got the buy-in of, of the, the Pashtun elders, the tribal elders. And my only hope is that they continue to have that buy-in, but we'll, we'll see.
I, you know, Jane, I hope you're at the symposium this weekend. I'm, I'm happy to share more about my experience if you are, but I can't add to Mark's. I did get to travel more than the, the average uh, spokesperson, I suppose, but I, I will say that I've met some of the best newsmen and women I've ever worked with anywhere, and particularly uh, uh, some of the news women of Afghanistan, extraordinary. You won't find better uh, anywhere, and it was a privilege to get to, to get to work with them. But with that, I guess, kind of set up or segue, I'd like to hand it over to to, to, to Brian Dempsey to kind of talk to us about how Wounded Warrior fits into this and, and, and his own. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Luke. And thank you, Mark, Musa, and Ambassador Goodwill for such an insightful discussion today. My name is Brian Dempsey and I have the privilege to work as the Government Affairs Director for Wounded Warrior Project. Uh, I wanna quickly reflect on how interesting this afternoon's discussion on the future of Afghanistan has been and actually do so by looking back to the past. I remember waking up on the morning of September 11th. Uh, my father worked on Wall Street. I grew up just outside of New York City and the events of that day hit very close to home, literally and figuratively. Uh, I didn't answer the call to arms that followed, but knew that I wanted to find a way to serve my country and all those who did. Uh, and in that regard, while so much has changed over the last 20 years, one thing that has endured is the commitment of Wounded Warrior Project to honor and empower wounded warriors, the brave men and women who raise their hands to volunteer in service to our nation. Their service and sacrifice for the security of our country is one we remember and honor each and every day. Uh, America may no longer be at war, but we recognize that the impacts of war and injuries can last a lifetime. Wounded Warrior Project's goal remains to foster the most well-adjusted generation of veterans in US history. We can only do that by continuing to support their ongoing needs. Uh, our organization provides the support veterans need with a focus on their physical, mental, and financial wellness. Every day, 44 new warriors and family members register for our no-cost services, and that's in addition to nearly 200,000 veterans service members and their families that Wounded Warrior Project serves today. Our free services in mental health, career counseling, long-term rehabilitative care, and policy advocacy improve the lives of millions of warriors and their families. And while I realize that everyone watching today may not feel like they need help, but the odds are good that someone you know does or one day will. Uh, last week, Wounded Warrior Project's Chief Program Officer, Jen Silva, testified about veteran mental health and suicide prevention before the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. And one of the things she emphasizes is the importance of peer support and connection and the power of a community that knows where to turn when someone needs help. Uh, she went on to say that saving the lives of veterans is a central part of our mission to honor and empower wounded warriors. Sometimes that comes as an intervention during crisis, but most of the times it's an extra interaction much further upstream to ensure financial security, improve healthy habits, foster greater connection in the community, or lead a veteran to their first mental health appointment. So as I wrap up here and return to the focus of this afternoon's forum, I wanna emphasize that we know that witnessing the withdrawal of US forces from Af Afghanistan has been a challenge for many who served overseas. At Wounded War Project, we're currently calling more than 40,000 of our alumni who were deployed to Afghanistan to check in and let them know that we're here for them. And that's my message for you here today as well, that Wounded War Project is here for you, those you serve with, those you're serving with now, and those who you may serve with in the future. So thank you to the World Affairs Council for hosting this impactful event and for being a leader in how we understand and advance the security of our country and the world. On behalf of my entire team, thank you all for taking the time to participate in this important forum. And should you ever need any support, Wounded Warrior Project is here for you. Brian, th thanks for that. I mean, what I take away is, you know, this isn't just a panel, this is a brotherhood and a sisterhood. Wounded Warrior Project's part of that. All of us feel that way uh, on, on, on this panel. And I appreciate everybody that uh, that, that tuned in and 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 your interest and, and, and your contributions. Um, probably my job is to shut up this point other than to thank the panelists again and throw it over to Megan to set the scene for what's uh, coming up. Thank you, Luke. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and thank you to Wounded Warrior Project for your support of the Global Security Forum and for everything you do day in and day out. Um, our panelists today were, um, were outstanding. I wanna encourage everyone to continue to join us for the rest of the week. We have an event tomorrow, same time, same place on radicalization um, and, and technology. So really important discussion. We also have our in-person 
and virtual global security forums on Friday. Friday, we're looking at the future of the defense industry and in trans and in transformation, technological transformation, and all day on Saturday. So find out more, gsf2021.com. Tell your friends, and I hope to see you all there. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.